All right, well, we're gonna keep it going. Welcome back. And um, our next panel, we're gonna talk about um, the next major use case that our developers are seeing, and it's gonna build on the presentation that Fred shared with us about all of the challenges of connecting sensors all the way to the cloud, taking a deeper dive into industrial automation and really edge to cloud connectivity. And really, what are some of the challenges that are facing bridging from that cloud uh, service and capability all the way down the sensor. So we're going to take a um, we're going to take a deeper dive into connectivity with our uh, with our panel with more industry experts to help build on the presentation that Fred shared with us earlier. So I'd like to welcome on stage our sensor to cloud connectivity panel. Welcome. Okay, all right, well, first of all, welcome everybody. I'm gonna just uh, introduce everyone really quickly. So first, um, from AWS, I'd like to introduce Richard Berry. Um, Richard, welcome. Uh, joining us back on stage from BMW's uh, head of IT uh, department at, at um, the Innovation Hub, uh, Fred Hasselbeck, welcome back. Welcome. Um, from Exor, uh, the Chief Technology Officer, Claudio Ambra, please welcome to the stage. Um, yeah, and CTO Exo International, so we are a company uh, located in Italy and we make industrial automation and we are uh, following the strategy of digitalization of the automation uh, with the cloud native technology. Uh, so, and uh, also we are part of the partnership with Lettis. We present today a uh, demo also how the evolution of the HMI to make services. Also the thematic today, the cloud native technology, how it's important to be connected uh, devices in the, in the field level. So I'm here today to share our experience in industrial automation and the evolution in industrial automation stuff. Thank you, Claudio. Really great to have you here. Uh, Mark Hoops is joining from our marketing team. To, uh, he's responsible for the industrial automotive uh, segments at Lattice. And then last but not least, Tom, welcome. Tom Ridden from uh, Mass Robotics is here to talk about all the new amazing applications that um, the uh, startup community as part of Mass Robotics is driving uh, around uh, connectivity. So welcome everybody. Um, Fred, again, thank you for um, really showcasing the innovation that is occurring um, at, on the factory floor. Right? I think when you talk to many people and they think about innovation, they don't realize how many things are happening in the, in the industrial setting, whether it's robotics, whether it's industrial networking, whether it's safety, whether it's cybersecurity, you're, you're in the midst of a lot of change. So, um, I think for today, what we really want to do, our goal, is to make the challenges and the opportunities that you shared with us at a high level in your presentation, we're going to take a click down and, and try to really understand what are those components that are driving some of those big rocks and how do we help work together with the development community to solve some of those things. So maybe to start the conversation, uh, you really talked about the edge. Richard, maybe give us a perspective from the cloud. At AWS, how do you look at the industrial edge what are some of the services that you hope to help industrial customers with by adding more intelligence and, and connectivity to some of the sensors and data that's, that's getting created out there? So I should say that um, I, I work for AWS IoT and one, the two large investment areas at the moment, one is industrial and the other is uh, automotive, you know, big growth areas. And um, I think one of, the, one of the biggest challenges that Fred may, may relate to is um, security. When you, when you start connecting uh, factories with uh, valuable data, very valuable processes, uh, and making them um, internet connected, then uh, making sure that security is always first and foremost, uh, first and foremost in your mind. Um, and that's... Um, yeah, that's, that's one of our primary focuses. Oh, that's great, no, I appreciate that. Um, Mark, um, maybe you could give us a little bit of overview. You know, Jim talked about uh, in his keynote, um, really all of the different sensors that are launching every single day, all with very, very different interfaces. Maybe, could you just give us a little bit of an overview of some of the complexity that Jim was talking about and kind of just articulate that a little bit more for the audience? Yeah, sure. So um, one of the things that's happening is more and more um, 
attempts to get higher levels of automation, re reduce the human workload and get more things, more intelligence at the edge. So that obviously requires more sensors, understanding the environment um, and understanding, you know, whether it's quality standpoint or um, automation in terms of moving product and things like that. You have all these different types of sensors that enable you to um, gather more visual information or more quality information about the, uh, uh, the end product that you're trying to build. And there, that, that drives higher demand for more connectivity, more different types of connectivity to all the different types of sensors. There is also a goal to try to move more and more things over to Ethernet. So today there are many different Ethernet, industrial Ethernet standards and many different field bus standards for connecting up all these sensors and devices in the factory. And it's leading to trying to sort of harmonize a little bit and be, uh, work around some standards like OPC UA and TSN, those types of standards that are uh, starting to become much more ubiquitous in the factory. You know, um, when I think about the different interface standards, I remember when I visited, Claudio, your beautiful factory in Italy, and I saw all the different connectors that were hanging from the wall. It looked like a, it was like a display of trophies of all the different industrial connectors that are out there. Could you maybe just talk about, you know, what are the, some of the major challenges your customers are facing with interface diversity, and what are some solutions that you see are really scalable to solve those problems? Yeah, you know, we also because the age experience of working in Industry 3.0 in the beginning, and uh, uh, it's clear that the paradigm in the industrial field is don't touch what is running, and is exactly opposite what we need to do now, because uh, the purpose of the connectivity, we need to change something. And uh, this is incredible. And in the beginning, we, we have to do evangelization. And uh, what I mentioned, Matt, before, we had to do uh, extra factory, uh, digital factory extra, just because we want to show that it's possible to change uh, this paradigm. Because if you want to take the advantage of the efficiency, the loss, uh, quality, uh, you must uh, be able to adapt uh, uh, your manufacturing. For, for example, we have a, a project running is a digital mess. I don't know if you are familiar with manufacturing execution system. It's very, very old software in the factory. Anytime your new product uh, was impressive, uh, Fred, this morning when you, you present uh, VLW SAA, when they have to make a new model, I, I, I cannot imagine how many things they have to change. Should be more dynamic. And for, of course, uh, you need to have a platform that uh, give you confidence that you are able to change and everything is running. So for this reason, uh, Matt, what we, uh, we have done is to create uh, a platform, uh, a digital platform uh, based on the cloud native technology uh, where you can make your twin model and you can have a, a framework uh, that enable you to develop the application. So the paradigm uh, don't, don't change with running is a gradually change. Of course, there are a lot of uh, uh, problems still to solve. So the, the, the machine builder and the factory owner, they don't like too much to have a permanent machine connected because uh, it's very conservative. It's my, my algorithm, it's my know-how. I'm able to do the machine better than others. So it's exactly opposite direction where you have an open approach to, to share the data. And uh, in, this, in this way, we, we, we expect uh, uh, next year's a lot of change because the most important is a business model because we are talking about technology, but uh, uh, this kind of, of a connectivity must be uh, able to sustain uh, economy and the machine builder need to have a servitization of the machine. This is a very important topic. Maybe we can discuss later uh, on discussion on the panel. Absolutely. You allude to the difference between IT and OT. Um, uh, Fred, maybe could you, could you talk about the differences in priorities between the IT department and the OT department, just so that the audience understands the, the, uh, the circular logic sometimes that we find ourselves in the industrial market? The IT department uh, is responsible to have a stable IT. Changes, Claudio says, always uh, dangerous for instable. Right. And we must uh, show, and, and that is important, we have uh, the, the sensors. Uh, because when I look, we have uh, for locating 3,000 sensors. 
and they must work. And the data we need in the first in the edge environment and later we give uh, to the cloud for analytics. So the two steps concept. Mm -hmm. And that is also in, in for us important. And that is the IT perspective for them. Understood, understood. Um, Tom, so maybe you could just introduce yourself a little bit more around your mission with Mass Robotics and talk a little bit about some of the sensor to cloud connectivity projects that you see with some of the smart people working in your organization. Sure, thanks. Um, so Mass Robotics, we're a nonprofit. We support the robotics industry. Um, we also have an innovation center in downtown Boston. Uh, we currently house about 85 startups that are all doing something in robotics. Um, the unique part about it is they are uh, covering so many different industries. I mean, we have companies that are focused on agriculture, health tech. Um, we have, of course, factory automation, warehouse automation. Um, they are all essentially doing what we call sense, plan, and act, right? And so in sensing, um, it's about perception. And as Mark mentioned, uh, the amount of sensors that people are embedding in robotics today is just exploding. Uh, the price of sensors are coming down, the capabilities are improving. Uh, but also the robots are getting much more complex environments. And so this requires them to have a broader understanding of the world they're operating in and therefore more sensors. Um, as we get that, there's more data. They need uh, to react to the data more quickly. And all of that can't be done at the edge. You, a lot of it can, there's no question about it. But a lot of times they'll want to then connect back and do some of the upper level processing in the cloud. So there's a, this balance of what do I do at the edge? What do I need to do to do maybe my uh, ODLA, obstacle detection, obstacle avoidance? How do I do that at the speed I need? But then how do I do some of the higher level computation back in the cloud? And so that's an interesting balance that we're watching right now. Oh, very interesting. Mark, t maybe talk a little bit different about, uh, talk a little bit more about the differences in just the uh, latency requirements for different applications in the industrial market, just to kind of round, round out what, what uh, Tom was saying there. Yeah, sure, so um, latency and predictability, you know, the lack of jitter or the very, very much uh, predictable actions are absolutely critical. Um, if you look at a factory environment, basically the one who produces as many products as they can, as fast as they can with all identical good quality. And so that requires tight synchronization between all the different elements of an assembly line or an inspection line and everything. And these things have to be real time. These have to be microsecond kind of accuracy. So there you need determinism and even you know, good software running on a CPU is not gonna be that accurate, right? It's gonna have a lot more jitter. So doing things in hardware, synchronizing over hardware and, and implementing real time functions and FPJs kind of helps out with getting things uh, all synchronized in a line as they communicate and, and pass data up and down the line. That's, that's, uh, that's a lot of interface bridging. Um, <laughs> Richard, um, coming back to you on the, uh, in, on the industrial IoT side, um, Free RTOS is a, is a great platform to be able to do open source based communication uh, and we're partnering on a lot of different uh, customer opportunities. Mm -hmm. Maybe just talk a little bit, a bit more about how do we think about free RTOS and the things that we can do with AWS IoT in the and some of the things that maybe you heard from Fred or the uh, opportunities that uh, Claudio was talking about or any of the, uh, the, the intersections that Tom was talking about with Mass Robotics where they're trying to juggle the, 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 the two optimization points there. Would love your feedback on that. Yeah, so uh, for those that don't know, FreeRTOS is a, a very small real-time operating system. Um, it's you know, designed, uh, well, it runs on your, RISC, on your RISC-V cores. It's one of the interesting things with uh, IoT, especially from the, coming from the cloud side, is the different characteristics, uh, the very, very broad, um, talking about the latency requirements. When you get down to the sensor level, then uh, some of the work we are doing at the moment with, uh, with lattices on TSN, for example, where um, we, have, uh, we have our own TCP IP stack, which is designed like all of the FreeRTOS software to be uh, as small and as simple as possible, uh, but the, the, the architecture of it uh, doesn't, doesn't give it the, um, the hard real-time characteristics that were required for the TSN. So some of the work we're doing now is to re-architect that to uh, make sure that we can um, remove all that data as far as, we can't change the laws of physics, of course, uh, as far as possible. Um, and then, you know, uh, 
that, like I say, that's, that's the, the hard real time at the edge, but then um, where we are sending that data uh, to the gateways where the latency isn't quite so, uh, quite so strict, um, all, the way up, you know, all the way up to the cloud. And what we want to be able to do is um, decide, where the, decide where the processing is going to be, if you like, that we can push processing further and further to the edge when it's needed, uh, and also be able to um, collect and filter data within gateways um, where, you know, where the, the hard real-time processing isn't, isn't so critical uh, to be able to unlock the value from that to cross the OTIT boundary to get the data in the cloud, to get all the data from multiple factories in, in one place. So uh, a lot of the work we are doing um, you know, spans, that, spans, that in, spans that entire range. Yeah, we are, um, and we appreciate your commitment to the open source community, to the developers community. Uh, Lattice is a member of OPC UA um, also as a way to, uh, to, to give access to, you know, really clear, when I think about sensor to cloud connectivity, I think of it as a highway with a bunch of barriers and you're just trying to navigate all those different barriers. You have security toll gates, you have, you know, some roads are tunnels, you know, all those different, all those different things. And I think what our developers appreciate is if we, can, if we can eliminate as many of those barriers as possible, it becomes a lot easier for us. So we certainly appreciate all of the work that you're doing to make that just ubiquitous, right? So then when we work with customers like Claudio or Fred, then we know we have a platform that we can leverage on our FPGA that can not have any of those barriers. So really appreciate the partnership there. Claudio, when, when um, you know, safety is a big part of the industrial market, right? How do, you th how do you think about sensor to cloud connectivity also with safety uh, in mind? How, how, do, how, how, does, how, do, how do some of the requirements, whether it's latency or the kind of interfaces that are required, how do, how do you think about that when it comes to industrial safety? Yeah, we see in the beginning and also following what uh, uh, AWS Azure did uh, try to have landing in the industrial field and uh, of course, they are, they are facing, uh, everybody is facing uh, topics right, related to safety part and real time, uh, low latency. Uh, this is a problem that is difficult to be, to be solved uh, of a cloud native technology. And this is a reason why edge computing is, uh, is moving. What we have done actually is we develop uh, uh, our own platform, um, middleware, uh, cloud native, uh, is, uh, name is Corvina. And uh, this is can be installed on premise because also uh, you have to think about hybrid uh, connection. When we say cloud, uh, I think it's correct for me to say cloud native because uh, uh, everybody is thinking on cloud. But uh, my, I know we have uh, several applications where they, they want to have a private cloud and hybrid insta uh, installation in the field for, for, for many reasons, also for security, proprietary of the data, and also for the cost sometimes. Uh, so the, what is we are doing is uh, in the developing edge computing that in one way they are connected on the on the cloud. So using the, the IoT technology is very very stable. We are very very happy. And QTT or everything related to the, the IoT technology is a, is a standardization is done. Uh, what is missing is how to manage the safety, how to manage real time. Uh, we have developed an edge computing the technology that is uh, um, using the advantage of the cloud. For, for example, for fleet management, OTA is necessary to use cloud. Uh, you mean over the air updates? Yeah, for, uh, if, we, if you don't have uh, such kind of approach, it's impossible to make a digitalization. Uh, before I say we have to change a more dynamic uh, use of the data especially what also Fred, you said, you must be able to use the data in the field. And uh, for this reason, cloud is necessary. The, on the other way, you must have a solid high reliability hardware for safety. So we are investing a lot on safety function and uh, uh, also in the real time. So it seems strange, but we, because uh, uh, everybody you know, the industrial field, the PLC is a programmable logic controller something stay 40 years to be to be uh, stable in in the market uh, but we decide to invest uh, plc and safety because uh, we have an approach is a bottom up so i mean we want to transform what is already exist uh, in the uh, to be adapted to the iot technology 
So means in the end, uh, PLC becomes software as a service. Instead to be, to use, uh, there are four language uh, for the 1131 uh, programming style. Maybe we can add uh, an additional language like Python or additional language more. So it means uh, our idea and our uh, strategy is uh, uh, to on the bottom-up approach. How we can go, grow up and how we can uh, converge in the IT technology starting the evolution of what already exists. Because 40 years means also 40 years of people that are not uh, so familiar with this technology. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to change the industry because the people are uh, very stable, company working many years, the same job. So this is the main issue I see for the future, for uh, evolution of the business also. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a rapidly evolving, but also a very long install based market that requires a lot of you know, the brownfield deployment coverage at, at the same time creating that framework for more scalable solutions as they get released down the road, which is what's exciting about our partnership with, with you, Fred, because I think being able to innovate with you, with the end customer in mind, the way that um, we've talked about in a different panel, I think that gives us something that we can give to our developers community as something that they can then go and take and write all kinds of new IPs and applications and software solutions based on a really scalable platform that that you guys are defining based on the needs of your customers. So that's that's really exciting for us. Maybe Mark, go in a step further and talk about how, how do you solve the challenges that the team has brought up with interfaces, with the IT versus OT um, paradigm? Um, how, how, do you, how do you think about the Lattice hardware portfolio and addressing some of those connectivity challenges in the industrial market? Yeah, so one of the things we have is we have, for example, our automate stack where we basically provide a platform that enables you to um, have a soft processor inside the system and flexible connectivity. Um, so that can be a very great starting point for connecting into the factory and, and showing off any one of the industrial networking standards, things like that. We also have other platforms, uh, such as the work we're doing with XOR, where you have a, a, a processor with an FPJ next to it, SOM module that can enable you to provide all kinds of connectivity to the main SOC that's sort of limited. So we give it the ability to do things in real time and connect to many more different types of interfaces. So lots of different ways through solutions, through um, modules and things like that, that we can help the industry more rapidly adopt uh, and adapt to the, the changing needs over time. Tom, how, how can we help as a community um, your startups that are really some of the smartest people on the planet, honestly, just humbly saying that, and m empowering them to develop you know, uh, new solutions for sensor to cloud connectivity? Like how, how could we help Mass Robotics and the, and the partners that you help uh, you know, drive these innovations become more successful? And how can our developers uh, help them be more successful? Yeah, one of the areas uh, that I'll highlight is, is around ROS. Um, so ROS is robotic operating system. It's kind of a middleware, peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, the ability to have tools to make it much easier to be able to incorporate ROS into your solution um, and to be able to encourage the, uh, I think, the communication um, with, within uh, the network. So uh, ROS will have a number of nodes, and the nodes will be for different elements of the robot. And uh, to be able to kind of optimize their communication um, with tools that you develop, so it's all around the software tools that you can provide these these, uh, these folks as they develop their robot. Ah, that's that's awesome, Fred. I um I got to tell you, I, I was able to visit your uh, your factory as well. So you know, Jim and Assam mentioned that they were able to to visit the the factory. I was able to visit Impressive. as well. I think I got in trouble because I went past some dotted lines in the factory that I was not supposed to go down. So I may not be invited back. There might be my picture up there. But um, it was amazing. And what was really amazing about it was everywhere I looked, there was an Ethernet cable. So can you, can you just explain the importance of Ethernet on the factory floor to your overall IT infrastructure? Yes, we need the connection. We have 500 PLCs in the assembly. They're connected with Ethernet. 500 PLCs. 500 PLCs in real-time communication. That is important. That is, we need, uh, the, we have no uh, time to lose data or connections. And that is Ethernet very important for us. No? 
And, and, and when we connect this to the edge components, and later we do it in the cloud, that is what uh, uh, Richard said for us in the cloud, we won't make bright spots. Bright spots because we want to use this data in the cloud for people in the production, uh, a leader from the line, to improve this data with low-code platforms, to make this visible and can say he make analytics. And that is, uh, I think, the important thing for us. The real-time communication, 500 PLCs, direct connect to the edge components, and the production is running. But the data, we also go to the cloud because other people in the assembly can use this data for analytics and say, I can optimize my process. That is also, we combine this in this way. And we use the, we have a software stack, PlantCon. PlantCon uh, connect uh, the, the, uh, about UPC, UPC, uh, the PLC, and also with Kafka Streams, the streaming service platform. In the streaming service platform, we can use for the people in the assembly to make reports, to make analytics, to optimize the production. So if I understand that correctly, you have this, within the BMW framework, you have the need for cloud-based services, which is good for AWS, I imagine. Um, but your, your task is really to get that data from the sensor to the cloud in a way that meets your requirements. And Ethernet is the right uh, overall uh, protocol to use. But what I'm hearing is you've also created um, this PlantCon framework on top of it that leverages some of the, uh, the free RTOS components, some of the OPCUA components, while then creating a seamless way to then connect those things within your, your, your environment. Is that something that, like if I'm a developer and I hear that BMW has this infrastructure that they are doing, do you want the support of the ecosystem to be able to go and drive that to, to the next level? How, how do you want the ecosystem to engage with BMW on those developments? That is the reason we make uh, collaboration. We want to use the ecosystem. Uh, first, first step, we want to roll out in all plants. We have the same standard. That is very important for us. And we have the same standard in the whole BMW. And then the next step is to say, yes, we want to go outside and when it's interesting in the ecosystem. But in the first step, we have the innovation hub, we tested that, and with the partners, and we have a contract and a partnership, and then we can go also outside for the ecosystem. Oh, that's great. Is it all APC UA? No? No, no, we have no old protocols. Mm -hmm. IFC is 1006 also, but uh, uh, OPC UI is the standard for us. That's great. Um, just kind of thinking about some of the other uh, sensor to cloud connectivity use cases. You know, industrial is certainly um, you know, one of those elements, but there's also you know, robotics in general um, that I think is, is one. When I think about a, 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 when I think about a, a robot, it's kind of what uh, Amit talked about in the AI keynote, which is you really can't connect everything to the cloud all at the time. So how do you, how do you um, bridge the gap between real-time performance for, from robotics to the needs of being able to send that data into the cloud? How do, you, how do you think about that synchronization, Tom? So that's one of the things we talked about before, is what, what do you do directly on the platform? Um, what are the latency requirements? What is the, the and, and power requirements? One of the things we even talked about earlier was, um, as you add more sensors, you require more power to run all these sensors, and the platforms just don't, are they getting smaller and smaller? And so they have less power to be able to provide for all these sensors, and then the com compute power. Um, so you want to understand what you need to do to plan and react to the changing environment. And one of the trends in robotics now is around what we call uh, collaborative robotics or human safe robots. So the ability to operate around a human um, and do and work in the same work environment. Um, so side by side a human, rather than having the robots caged, have the robots right next to you. But when you do that, you now introduce a whole new level of sensing that you are required, right? Um, so it's, it's uh, incredibly important not only to sense the human and their activity, but to anticipate their activity, and then to replan, to rapidly replan, because the humans don't do what you expect them to do. Um, and so your original path plan, maybe if you're using an arm in, in the factory, in, in, 
POW plant, it was going to go in one direction, and now a human has walked in that in that zone, that work zone. You have to replan uh, incredibly quickly. Um, so it requires better sensing, more sensing, and then more rapid sensing. But as I talked about that balance, what do we do there on the robot? Limited power, limited uh, capabilities, and what can we do in the cloud? Um, and everyone's approaching that differently. Um, I think they're all looking at what tools make it easier to do it in the cloud, because they would all like to do more in the cloud. It reduces their cost. If they can limit the computational power on any of these platforms, um, it's better for them. And so uh, it's just an ongoing balance. Oh, that's wonderful. Claudio, I feel like you have struck a really good balance managing the use cases that your customers have around safety, around new applications, around cybersecurity, which we're going to talk about in a different panel, but at the same time, definitely want to recognize that effort. You know, what are some of the, what are some of the top issues that your industrial customers are trying to solve around connectivity that XOR specifically is addressing that you are, you know, that you'd like to share with our developers? How can, and how can they help? to bring that to more customers for you? Yeah, the, we, we have an experience that the programming tool framework is very important. I mean, uh, I mentioned before, PLC, HMI software, or language used there are very uh, solid and uh, used many, many years. So what we are doing, we understood that uh, successful to support our customer is to develop a framework. Uh, before in the panel was a nice, very good discussion, AI function, and uh, try to think a scenario how to integrate AI function in the PLC, and it's like to put together uh, 20 years old people and 60 years old people in the same time. <laughs> they, they can talk, but uh, for sure they have a different experience. And uh, uh, th so the, what we have done, we created uh, in Corvina platform a framework where the PLC, HMI, everything is moved in a simple way, object-oriented programming. Of course, AI function must be easier and to be integrated in the same way, because uh, uh, what advantage of AI function and what advantage of this technology? We need to have a better performance of the machine, services, because uh, in the end, uh, I mentioned before, servitization is, is a, an important topic because, uh, uh, and, and to do that, you need to provide a tool that is simp simple to use. So this is what we are doing uh, on XOR. Uh, of course, what Fred said is very, very important. Solid edge is a mandatory because um, uh, before we talk about OPC way, um, you, everybody remember 2012, 2013 when OPC way starts. It's very good, it's semantic description. Uh, it's what you need to have a description of the model of data, uh, but uh, the robots are running uh, and the I.O. and the critical machinery are running because they are optimized field bus. They have a BIP like EtherCAT, Profinet, Ethernet EP. Uh, so this kind of uh, field bus, uh, they are not object uh, oriented, they are not semantic description, they are very, very efficient. Uh, what uh, Mark said before, what we developed together working on Lattice is uh, um, to make this kind of convergence. So what the solution we are providing to, to customer, also customer, I mean also customer, they want to develop their own product, not only a machine builder or factory owner, is to provide a model where there are uh, Lattice FPGA and uh, CPU, like ARM CPU, uh, neural process unit, unit in order to be execution of uh, uh, in the field AI function, uh, but to be able to make a convergence and to be able one module, one platform to program in one uh, one tool, uh, because uh, the problem I see in the future is uh, uh, AI is very powerful, but still you need to take care of the connective field bus, PLC, uh, motion control, a lot of stuff. So we are integrating the FPGA. Um, Real-time part, as Max said before, Fitbus, uh, OPC way. There are new emerging standards. For, for example, OPC way FX is very promoting, and uh, and you need to have FPGA able to optimize this uh, cycling uh, and, uh, for reliability because uh, you have too much risk if you stay in the virtual machine only or you have only the 
uh, Docker container, uh, Linux-based uh, uh, solution. So maybe in the future, the reliability will be better. But now I, f I see in the next years, uh, very important to have this convergence, uh, IT, OT, hardware, and platform. So just to, just to explain that to the audience a little bit more. So what, um, you know, the way I understood that, uh, Claudio, is all of these new technologies that are offering additional intelligence, whether it's the AI uh, example that um, NVIDIA shared uh, at our conference or other applications that might be at a different response rate than the real-time requirements of the industrial market. So in the industrial market, it's the speed of safety, right? The speed of industrial, right? It's, you know, to make sure that, uh, that the production yeah, is safe. Yeah, you try as much as, if you try uh, OPC UA, uh, TSN, to make a benchmark in the using field bus like EtherCAT uh, and uh, you are not the same performance. So because they are so optimized and uh, not all semantic description. So that is the issue because needs some convergence, maybe some switch, some bridge. So that's what you're describing, right? Which is, hey, you have all these new applications that are running at this clock cycle, yet you have the real time requirements of the industrial market that for safety reasons, for production reasons, have to happen in real time. And bridging to that, converging to that, is I think what um, the, you know, the strategy is from, 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 from Lattice, right? In the announcement that you saw in partnership with NVIDIA, also the announcement in the partnership with uh, BMW, we are, we're focused on those real time industrial requirements. Could you talk a little bit more, Mark, about where do you see our tools, our software solutions, and the work that we're doing with not only our panelists, but also the developers at our conference to drive the next level of sensor to cloud connectivity capability in our product portfolio. Could you maybe talk a little bit more about what was launched and, and why is it relevant for, the, for this application? Yeah, sure, so um, a couple of different areas. Some is our collaboration with uh, AWS IoT and XOR and those areas, but also on the Automate stack, um, providing this reference design with all this connectivity enables people to have a good starting point for enabling all the, the connections. And the, I uh, just want to go up one level too. Why does everything want to be connected in the factory? And the biggest thing is because they need insight into the factory and what's happening on all the machines to maximize efficiency and availability. So they need to understand that everything's operating well and they need to understand if anything is starting to degrade or um, maybe uh, have some sort of issues. So you can have continuous uptime. You don't have a factory going down because something fails. Something called predictive maintenance is what you can get out of uh, uh, getting access to the data. And actually predictive maintenance is, is one of the solutions we provide as well in the, the automate stack as, a, as, a, as an option. So you can either do some local processing and understand what's happening at the sensor level or at the machine level at the edge, or that you can take all that data and stream it up in the cloud and get larger analytic processing um, in you know, the data center. And in terms of the interface diversity, can you talk about Lattice and like, so hearing all the interface diversity challenges and the standards that are available, can you talk a little bit about the, our, our, you know, the Lattice interface strategy and how we're approaching all, that, all, the, all those different capabilities and how, where do our developers fit in? Yeah, so uh, you know, <clears throat> I mentioned before, um, we've got all the different flexibility with the standard IOs and the higher speed performance. So, um, we can connect to all the different uh, field buses. We can connect to industrial ethernet. Um, we can also provide higher bandwidth connectivity as needed for um, most things in the industrial world are at 10 megabit, 100 megabit, gigabit and below. We have the ability now to also stream higher capabilities like 10 gig if you need um, to move around camera data or maybe large amount of data from a machine you really want to do large uploads periodically. Um, so those are areas that we can help. Um, and, then, and then we also touched on this earlier where um, sand robotics or automated type platforms, um, we are working with NVIDIA to help stream in all the data from the sensors. Um, so those, the, the bridging of taking MIPI sensor data, uh, LVDS, analog, whatever it is, and streaming it into a compute platform, either on a local machine that's moving around the factory or in the, in the environment. Um, that can all be processed locally, but then also some of it can go up to the cloud for additional processing. So it's a, it's a mix, um, and uh, we basically enable all the, active, all the connectivity to the sensors and the streaming, 
um, into a local compute platform or into a remote compute platform. And, and do we develop all that internally or do we work with partners on developing that? How do you, how do you view the, some of these interfaces with, with our partner community? It, it, it's both. There, there are suppliers to the, all the industrial Ethernet um, um, standards and then there are the open standards. So we, we work a lot with partners to incorporate their solutions into uh, the Automate stack as, as an option. So you can have all different types of connectivity uh, in, in terms of uh, communication. Got it, so, for, so the call to action to our developer community is there's a ton of innovation happening in the industrial market. It's all about getting sensor data in this growing sensor ecosystem up to the cloud. It's all about using standards to be able to do that seamlessly and scalably, but at the same time trying to merge with these emerging applications that provide all kinds of new services that can improve efficiency, productivity, and just overall ROI, right? So our call to action to our developers are, these interfaces run on Lattice FPGAs, and we would love to see more and more connectivity solutions that help our ecosystem partners, our customers, go and drive these capabilities. So we are, we are open for your ideas and to, to engage with our panelists. I want to also remind everybody um, in, in the viewership here that uh, all of our partners here have contributed to different um, uh, sessions where they talk about their specific either standards or implementations or problems that they see as opportunities that we can solve together, all on our developers conference portal online. So please go to lattice.semi.com and go and explore the various uh, content and demos that the, the team has uh, um, uh, shared with us. Uh, can, I, can I make a point there as well that um, although I work for AWS, FreeOSOS is open source. It's uh, very, very widely used, MIT licensed. So the work we're doing with TSN is available to everybody. It's not, it's not just an AWS IoT thing. Sometimes we give the impression that it is. <coughs> like, uh, it, it's there for everybody, and anybody that wants to contribute would be, we'd be very grateful. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Richard. And Matt, one of the things I want to point out, you mentioned uh, sensor data to the cloud. They actually don't want to send the sensor data to the cloud. They want to actually act out on the data locally uh, and then send part of it to the cloud. And so I think the more the developers can develop new algorithms to make better sense, um, when you think of the variety of sensors, right, you're going to have an IMU, a LiDAR, stereo, vision. Um, if you can come up with better edge detection and, and things so that you can limit the amount of data that you send to the cloud, that's really important. And I think that's a real benefit of an FPGA um, is the ability to both come up with those unique algorithms, but also to be able to swap them out, uh, right? As we improve these algorithms, to be able to then just reconfigure and put a new algorithm in, you get the same sensor, but now you're doing more with the data that you're getting, you're getting off that sensor. Yeah, I think that's a, a better articulation of what I was trying to describe by pushing, pushing the processing uh, as close to the edge as you can and, and filtering and cleaning and just sending the data which is valuable up to the cloud. That, that's excellent. Um, how, how should we think about wireless standards within within your uh, with, within cloud to connectivity? We talked a lot about uh, uh, you know wired standards, but what about wireless standards? Are there any new uh, things that we should think about in the context of, of the wireless community in, in the industrial market? You mentioned five G in your presentation, Fred. What about other uh, you know whether it's uh, short distance or long distance communications? How do we think about that in the industrial context? We want to test in the innovation hub to have only 5G, no cable. That was the idea we want to, I hope next year, to make only 5G, no cable. That was a strategy. But I don't know it works. I believe not in the first step, but in the future. At the moment, we have cable, we have Wi-Fi, we have 5G. But it no. costs money. Uh, and we want to, uh, to save and say, can we only use once 5G, Wi-Fi, or cable? But cable is costs money when you, and that is we want to test in the innovation hub. Interesting. To say the same hole with one 5G, only 5G, connect to the PLCs, or that is one of the use cases next year. Interesting. Yeah. Claudia, how about yourself? I think this is very important. Uh, we, we are also making, uh, you, you, you visit uh, Verona, the, the smart factory at Exor. Uh, we have a 5G lab where we are testing use cases. 
One of the reasons uh, is a similar uh, what happened in the, the smartphone. Why a smartphone was able to enable the business? Because you, you buy, you connect, it works. If you buy a machine, you start the machine, you start the firewall, port, AP port. Uh, I, I know everybody expert in the IT, they say is a, after, after they say, okay, you can be connected there. So for this reason, I think the 5G uh, will be very strategic. Uh, I agree with what Fred said. And uh, we also decided we are making a small, a small plant in, uh, in Cincinnati. It's uh, uh, 2,000 square meters, so no big, but we produce a, a product made in the US. And it's completely 5G. Of course, we solid edge connection inside the robot um, and the devices where there is a real time. Means uh, machine to machine is uh, uh, 5G. Th think about an advantage, for example. Uh, one is immediately connected. So you can start to have uh, like a AWS uh, a business immediately or because of machinery are connected uh, in, the, in the cloud and native. Uh, but the other advantage is you can uh, balance the CPU workload. Uh, for, for example, we tested, uh, uh, before we talk a lot about AI uh, uh, inference network, it's very, very heavy. Sometimes you have a space in the machine that is uh, computation free. You are 5G bandwidth connected. You move some algorithm from one machine to another and you can create uh, uh, similar to the feed level cloud. So feed level cloud means uh, like a cluster, computers. Uh, and the, the advantage of 5G is the protocols, IP protocols are running over it and it's clear that uh, the target is to, in the 5G, not to have too much uh, dependence from the different hardware vendor. You have uh, many protocol, you have only one protocol, only one carrier, and it's work. In, in, for safety, we have, uh, it works also. Me of course, mechanism is a black channel mechanism. You must have, uh, uh, heartbeat, uh, every one millisecond you refresh wireless cycle because you know wireless could be not uh, enough available in some environment. If the connection is disconnect, of course, uh, the, the base station where there is not received the heartbeat stop the machine. And uh, so it's also use cases that are approved uh, in the certification, seal free certification, are also running safety. Uh, in my opinion, future will be very, very important for uh, IoT and uh, digitalization of the factory. So, perfectly agree, Fred, with you. <laughs> Go there. <laughs> no, thank you for that. Thank you for that insight. You know, one one last topic here before uh, before closing the panel. You know, all of sensor to cloud connectivity is all about you know creating digital twins, driving productivity, making more BMWs ship out of the factory every single day. Right. That's what's what it's all about. Can, we talk, can you talk a little bit about power consumption and how important the power consumption calculation is in enabling these use cases in, in all the different intersections that we, you, know, you can talk about technology? Maybe Fred, if you want to kick off, you know, how does BMW look at power consumption within the factory and you know, how, should, how should developers think about you know, platforms and, and power consumption in their design methodology? Yes, as you say, it's, it's important. Uh, uh, um, we do it together with partners also to the power consumption. And uh, that's, you, you say, it's a very important thing for us. Do, uh, have you a really good question? Or you want an uh, overview? Well, you know, it really the question is, you know, in the, in the choices you're making, you know, how, how high up is power consumption in the criteria for whether you adopt a technology to address sensor to cloud connectivity? I believe it's very important. So, for us. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have met in the, in the Corvina platform, we have 30% of the project are energy management uh, stuff because uh, it's easy to, to see how you can save money uh, in making data computation in the real time. And sometimes you need uh, to switch off something is not running in that time. And uh, so, especially in the, in the time where, the, especially in the gas cost uh, last year was very, very expensive. So for sure, power management is very, very important because you save money. And uh, we are also machinery in the process control like uh, Uven for ceramic. Italy is a country produce machinery for ceramic. Think about the oven ceramic is 800 degree running 
24 hours, and if you are able to save some money there, <laughs> it's uh, important. In the electronic, for sure, the AI acceleration, uh, edge computing, I expect uh, will be another topic because uh, power consumption is uh, especially for reliability and TBF of the hardware on the field is also important. I'll thank you for that as well. what platform you're designing for um, as you think about power consumption. Oh, that's great. You know, so power monitors at the sensors, because if you have too much thermal dissipation in cameras, for example, you'll degrade the camera, the image. So it kind of matters all over the system, especially for autonomous machines. Yeah. Wonderful. OK, well, I first of all want to thank you guys again. Um, appreciate the partnership in our developers conference. Appreciate the insights around sensor to cloud connectivity. Uh, I hope uh, next time we get together, we can talk about the next level of engagement and innovation and partnership together. For our developers out there, there's a ton of innovation happening in the industrial market. It's all about clearing that highway of barriers from the sensor to the cloud. And there's lots of opportunity to, to use Lattice FPGAs as a platform to create the innovation for that using standards like FreeRTOS OPC UA and others. So I want to thank all of our panelists. Uh, please give them a round of applause. And thank you for joining.